Hello, I'm Susan Smith Nash, and I'm just really happy to be here today because I'm going to share with you a film that I recently watched numerous times and analyzed a little bit of research on. And I'm familiar with the, the, the director, the auteur, and uh, his work. And it's part of the Cine de Oro de del cine me mexicano or época de oro del cine mexicano. In other words, the Mexican cinema golden age. And it's just truly remarkable, especially the film noir during the 50s and 40s, 40s and 50s, because the films that were made in Mexico were not hampered or impeded in any way by the Hays Code that was going on in in um, Hollywood at the same time. So what that means is that the issues that are explored can go deeper and darker, and they don't necessarily have to have happy ending. And there's a kind of um, gritty realism that that's is both Gothic and, and sort of that German romanticism and more. But I, I'm really happy to have the chance. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, about it. So I'm going to be sharing my screen. So let's do this. And as I share it, I'm also going to sort of describe to you some background. And I just like to encourage you to go to the, the film itself. So basically what we're talking about today is the film by Julio Borracho a Mexican director who was born in 1909 and died in um, 1978. And he had a really interesting background that I will go into a little bit more of that. But it, essentially the movie is from 1951. It's called Paraíso Robado, Stolen Paradise. And it's a, a great example of film noir, but I'd like to say that here's the auteur, or the director, Julio Bracho, 1909 to 1978. And basically in his films, he challenges the ambiguity that's characteristic of Mexican cinema. That is to say that the principal characters do not have a fixed identity within themselves, but instead they are composites, in this case, of reminiscence, sometimes of nostalgia, nostalgia, other times of desire, but they are always shaped and formed by a tremendous sense of longing. In Stolen Paradise, Julio Bracho deepens his quest to propel the viewer in the same destabilized space as a protagonist, and thus have the viewers experience the same loss of identity within a, a vortex of emotional shock and longing, and then self-questioning when one perceives that the long forbidden, always forbidden, or out of reach, love could suddenly be in reach. And then the, co the conquest is a conflict because to solidify the conquest, would mean to go into an ethical no man's land, which we will see here and we see in others, other films by Julio Bracho. So in this case, when the esteemed medical doctor and professor, Carlos de la Vega, learns that the young student he sort of secretly yearns for has lost her memory in the shock of seeing her uncle murdered. And then when she mistakes her professor for her fiance, Doctor de la Vega, is thrust into an emotional and ethical maelstrom. On the one hand, he wants to protect her. On the other hand, he's deeply in love with her, despite the age difference, which is at least 20 years, probably more, and the incredible opprobrium of his colleagues. The story is reinforced by dramatic cinematography of Alex Phillips. And Alex Phillips also worked with other directors such as Emilio Hernandez and 
his work is just stunning. It, I'm, I have to say that the films that Julio Bracho does that are, do not involve Alex Phillips are kind of um, pedestrian, even once they mediocre or even tedious. So, you know, Alex Phillips is cinema, cinematographic genius. At any rate, what Alex Phillips does is he utilizes influences from German romance, expressionism and romanticism and film noir. To, and to do that, he manages to visually represent identity formed and shaped by reminiscence, and also the shadowy constructs of longing. Stolen Paradise augments the series of psychological dramas and launches the career of Irasema Dilian, who would be nominated for an Ariel Award for Best Actor. So essentially, we've got a couple of characters in this film, but we'll go into that. Further, that we see Dr. Carlos de la Vega, he's a doctor of psychiatry and a professor at the University UNAM, <laughs> Universidad Autónoma de Mexico. We have Marcela, a student who loses her memory after a shock, and Lucia, the nurse and rather obsessive assistant to Dr. de la Vega. We have Don Gustavo. Marcela's uncle, who is murdered in cold blood in front of her. We have Julio Solorzano, Marcela's um, not so nice boyfriend, aka murderer, aka <laughs> scheming dog. <laughs> and then we have the Abuelita de Marcela, which is Abuelita's grandmother. So Let's just go in and look at the, um, the summary. Carlos de la Vega is a renowned doctor who specializes in psychiatric disorders. He teaches at a medical university in Mexico. He struggles with his conscience and with, the desi with desires. He falls deeply in love with Marcela, his young former student, who is now his patient. She has suffered a deep psychological trauma, which has left her with amnesia. And worse, she has confused Dr. de la Vega with her fiance and cannot leave his side without feelings of anxiety. The truth starts to take shape as it becomes clear that Marcela is in mortal danger. Someone wants her dead and she has no idea why. She almost falls into a deep trap devised by her duplicitous scheming former fiance before she hears the recording of a poem by Mexican poet Javier Villay Rutia, made by Dr. de la Vega, he and Marcela are together. The poem clears her amnesia and she recalls that her fiance murdered her uncle Gustavo and that they want to kill her in order to keep the money that they stole. She also becomes aware that her regard for Dr. de la Vega is not a case of mistaken identity, but that she indeed loves him for himself and that he is the love of her life. Since Marcela is now of sound mind, Dr. de la Vega may have a completely clear conscience and accept and repay her love. So I've just totally revealed the entire plot to you, but <laughs> that'll be okay. The, the, the story itself, is one thing, the mood it puts you in is another. So as we start out, we'll see that here we have a train station and a train coming in. And this is in a little town of Rinconcito, which means tiny little corner. Rinconcito is where Marcela grew up before she, and where she, lived before she went to Mexico City to go to the university, and it's where her grandmother, Abuelita, lives. So she's in Rinconcitos. And what is she doing every day? Every day when she hears the train coming into the station, she runs to the station. She runs across to every single, every single window, and she frantically clears the window with her hand 
to see a look inside as though she's looking for someone. And she does this every single time she hears the train. So she runs from her grandmother's house and boom. And she gets a lot of exercise. Surprisingly, nobody says anything <laughs> except for a reporter who re re um, reports on it and um, publishes this strange repetitive activity in the newspaper in Mexico City. And guess who reads it? Dr. De La Vega. Dr. De La Vega doesn't see a picture of it because it doesn't have a person, but Dr. De La Vega as a person who studies abnormal psychology is intrigued. Of course he's intrigued, very intrigued. <laughs> and so, so he races to the, um, he decides to go to, to Rinconcitos. But here we see the beautiful, beautiful Maricela and her look of just vulnerability and longing. It just goes against through her face. She has lost her memory. She doesn't know why, but she does have a sense of identity based on a shadowy memory of something and a shadowy memory of longing, longing and a feeling of love. Here we have Dr. De La Vega looking pensive and intense, very intense. And he is wondering what is going on. And, he, and he's starting to wonder, like, does he potentially know this person? And you can see this, like, he's sitting in his, his um, train car. And I mean, okay, personal note, I want to try, try and travel so I can go in these old trains in Mexico. These passion, passenger trains and passenger cars are gorgeous. And in all, they're very plush, very relaxing. You can sit and read, you can um, do all kinds of things and eat, snack, but you also can watch the beautiful, beautiful uh, landscape go by. And so they're going into the mountains and um, probably La Sierra Madre, um, Occidental, because that's the big um, mountain chain that goes down and across down <laughs> Mexico. Okay. So now that's what you're seeing here is the here and now. Now we flash back and I'm just going to fill you in on what, what's happened. We flash back to when Marcela is Dr. De La Vega's student. And he says, well, I'm going to come by your, your house. I need to tell you something. And he's a friend of her uncle Gustavo. Well, he is, we think, we suspect, going to declare his love to her. But he doesn't get a chance. She goes, she's entranced by a toy, a new toy. Well, a shiny thing. <laughs> it's, it's not a toy, but it's a, a recording device that records her voice. And she's enchanted that she can record and have forever the memory, the presence of, of her loved ones, even if they're gone, she can have their recording. So she's looking around and he's saying, well, okay. And she goes, will you make a recording? He goes, well, I don't know what to record. What shall I record? She goes, well, I don't know, but help me get this started. He goes, it's easy. Let me show you how. So he shows her how, and then he, um, talks to her and basically he finds a poem that's called Somber Madrigal. And this, the poem is by the poet uh, Victor Villarrutia and it's so gorgeous. The English version that I made is not as beautiful but it captures the meaning. So it starts, somber madrigal. Fortunate is our love, which nothing and no one names. Forgotten prisoner, without light, without witness. Secret love, which turns the shadow into honey. 
this barren cell into a burgeoning fig. So it goes from barrenness to um, fruitfulness. So essentially, what I love about that poem is that it reinforces the chiaroscuro and the, the techniques that have been um, that are in place and that are being done by Alex Phillips, the cinematographer, and Julio Bracho has in his vision, directorial vision to, to do. So we have all different ideas of darkness that turns into honey and shadows as secrets that are transformative and fruitful. And that's where things start to blossom and become beautiful, like a love. <laughs> like, and, and so here we go. He's recording the, the recording and it will become very important because she is to lose her memory. So what happens is that she loses her memory. Here, memory, okay, that was a flashback. Now we flash to when he gets off the train and he sees her, he recognizes her. Marcella. She looks at him blank. Who? Who are you? Ah, Rome, Rome. I don't know you. We don't trust you. So he talks to her. Then he goes and visits her grandmother. Her grandmother says she does this every day. She runs to the train station. She has no memory of who she is, anything. She met, remembers how to get around the house. She knows who I am. But she has no recall of a big chunk of time. But she saw her uncle be shot and die in cold blood. And then they told her that her boyfriend was killed as well, her fiance, although she has no memory or recollection or knowledge of that directly. So they walk through the churchyard and he gets, some, he gets her flowers. Then they come across a pond. She looks down and she sees herself kind of reflected with a cloud behind her. It's a brilliant shot. And in, in that moment, she flashes to a strong feeling. And she remembers that she was at that same church to get Mary and that she was wearing a wedding gown. Oops. So she thinks, looks up and she looks at Julio. No, Julio Roger, not the director. <laughs> she looks at Doctor de la Vega, and she suddenly, boom, thinks that he is her fiance and that they are to get married. So she falls into his arms and just professes her love to this most incredible, and I would say obsessive and clingy and needy way possible. He likes it, but doesn't like it because he knows it's ethically problematic because she has no idea who he really is. She thinks. He's Julio Solorzano, her, um, her fiance, the duplicitous, not nice guy. Well, not everything is so happy. So he, he takes her back to Mexico City and wants to take care of her, get her medical treatment, help her restore her memory. So they go back home. She's totally in love with him. He's like, oh, well, I'm going to spend time with you, but. Hmm. And he gets home, and here is the nurse now out of her out of her nurse's outfit, and she's now in her very beautiful and gorgeous suit. And she's speaking to a guy who's a detective, the police, who says, Hmm, you know, Marcella is in danger. Somebody wants her dead because her, you know, her uncle was murdered in cold blood in front of her. And there are documents and securities worth millions and millions of pesos that are missing. She goes, hmm, well, <laughs> some knowledge I can use to split them up. Anyway, but split them up, not going to be so easy. Why? Because Marcela cannot live without, without him. And Dr. De La Vega is so written, tormented with guilt that he says, I can't do this. I'm, you have to leave. In the meantime, his colleagues are going, uh, 
remember that was your student, right? Uh, we can't talk to you. We are horrified, especially because she starts living with him and he starts taking care of her. Finally, he says, okay, okay. You cast me out of my rights at the hospital as a doctor. I get it. But can I still check her in to get some medical care? They said, yes. So time goes on. She shows up at her house. This is the same house she had forgotten, now she remembers. And she thinks she's there. She has not total memory. She just says a little bit. And she looks at the recording um, device, the machine, the tape machine, and there's the, the uh, microphone, and she says, well, I'll listen to it. Well, as she listens, um, her boyfriend, bad guy, comes in to kill her. Thankfully, the policeman's there, and he shoots her bad boyfriend first, her, the murderer, and then when she hears the recording, she remembers everything. So then we flash forward, she's back um, at Rinconcito, and she has gotten off the train, and she see, looks off into the distance, and she hears the train coming. She doesn't run to the train station, but she waits, and there she sits. She's Doctor de la Vega, and it has a beautiful ending. She says, um, now you believe that I always loved you? And he says, yes, I do. I finally, I do believe that. I realized that the feelings that you had were sincere and sincerely for me. And she, and he asks, how long did um, you love me? And she says, since forever. So it's sort of interesting. There are a lot of really fascinating themes in this film. And I have an article that's at Humanities Institute that I'd like to encourage you to read. And I delve into the themes of identity and forbidden love, jealousy, memory, crime, appearance versus reality, psychiatric disease or condition. And they also go into character analysis and, and probe the character, the persona of Dr. Carlos de la Vega and also Maricela. And I'd just like to say that, that um, I would like to say that, that some of the things that make this film so fascinating, besides the intensity, are the use of, of, of things that cause visual and auditory metaphors for a condition of lost identity. So, so like to, to pick a condition of being that's characterized by amnesia, Bracho brilliantly uses reflective surfaces. And in those reflective surfaces, we saw them in the, in the, the, in the windows, in the, in the pond, in the little puddle. We see images that are blurred, fragmented or even deceiving. So for describing the slow process of regaining oneself and becoming whole once again, Bracho uses the concept of voice recording to bring a loved one back into one's conscious awareness. So the subject of the recording is important because in Stolen Paradise, it's a fragment of a poem about a secret, unnamed, unacknowledged love that when introduced to an isolated suffering one, a unity is possible. And so a bounty of psychological fruitfulness can be possible even within the Spartan spaces of a mind suffering from amnesia. And the film is also unique in its blend of in interior and exterior spaces. And so both have reflective surfaces and both have deep dark spaces of darkness, which again, create a visual metaphor for what is occurring in the minds of both Doctor de la Vega and also Marcela and her condition of amnesia. For Doctor de la Vega, his inner 
ethical dilemma and also a sense of his own identity are framed around his face as he looks at Marcella or thinks of her. In the pensiveness of his face, we see an identity on hold. So Doctor de la Vega has an identity on hold or at least enthralled to her. Marcella's torment of amnesia is illustrated in interior shots where the chiaroscuro photography captures the notion of a mind, with dark lakes of oblivion. And the reflective surfaces, the mirrors, the puddles of windows, either show her only partially or completely blurred, which also forms a powerful visual metaphor for identity that is emergent or submerging. And it suggests to the viewer that such may be possible in one's own mind or experience. So just finally, as a psychological drama, Stolen Paradise explores some of the same territory as Baraccio's other films. For example, there's an ethical dilemma that involves whether or not he should provide medical treatment to a person he has an emotional relationship with. And I would have to say that he's not effective when he's in a relationship with his um, patient. The concept of stolen paradise refers to his nurse assistant, Lucia's scathing commentary that by carrying on an intimate relationship with a former student and patient suffering from amnesia, who does not remember him as her teacher, but who has confused him for her fiance, he is in essence stealing someone else's paradise. However, in contrast with Bracha's other psychological dramas, there are no monsters here. Instead, there's a great deal of tenderness. And much to Dr. de la Vega's relief, Marcela loves him even more after she regains her memory. And she acknowledges that she felt love for him, even though she could not express it when he was her professor. Just a very happy ending. <laughs> and and I, I can go on and on. And I did in my article. So please, please refer to it. I'm going to put it in the show notes. And in the meantime, I just want to thank you for this and for being here and spending a few minutes talking about something or listening to a discussion of one of my favorite films by one of my favorite authors, oh, directors, of oh, part one of my favorite, if not my totally favorite um, films in the, which are the films from the Mexican cinema, golden cinema, or golden age of Mexican cinema. So anyway, thank you very much. And please like, subscribe, and leave comments. I am very happy for this. And I want to thank Humanities Institute for, it, for giving me the support and inspiration to do this. And, and um, thank you also to Humanities Institute for publishing my article and to, for their vision too, which is just absolutely wonderful. So thank you.